Barr from speechmodification.com, and this is my smart American accent training. Welcome to our Saturday live question and answer class. In this class, we usually start with a topic for American accent, American pronunciation, or today we're going to be talking about a few words and phrases and the meaning. Do feel free to put your questions at any time in the chat. You can ask about pronunciation of words, sounds, uh, sentences, anything that would be helpful for you, go ahead and ask, and I'll turn to your questions in just a moment. So at the beginning today, I wanted to talk about some phrasal verbs and an idiom. Hold back, hold on, and hold down the fort. So um, these, as you know, as speakers of English, we have many, many phrasal verbs where the verb to hold has a literal meaning. I'm holding my pen, I'm holding the board. But when I add a preposition, it becomes a phrasal verb and it changes the meaning. And we use many of these in daily speech and um, it's very useful to be aware of them, know how to say them uh, and what they mean. So when we're talking about holding back, if I'm going to hold back, it means I'm not going to say something or I'm not going to do something. So you might use it, for example, um, uh, he needs to hold back on that. Um, he needs to not say that or not do that. Um, uh, and sometimes we use it with on, as you noticed, hold back on. Um, and then we have hold on. Um, we, we use this in a couple of different ways. The more figurative way, if I ask you to hold on, it means to wait. Um, I think that comes from hold the line, uh, hold on when you're on the phone. So we used to be holding the phone up to our ear um, and we would say, hold on a minute. Um, we also use uh, hang on for that. Um, and in the phone, with the phone, we used to hang on to the phone or hang up the phone. So that might be part of the origins there. Um, we also have literally holding on to something, um, which I can say I'm holding on to the pen, but usually, if I'm holding on versus just holding, it means I'm maintaining my hold. So someone climbing up a mountain or rock climbing might hold on to the ropes, literally. Um, they all, you might also ask them to hold on while I adjust these ropes, um, meaning wait, um, don't keep climbing. And then we have the phrase hold down the fort. Um, and this means to um, stay in place, uh, to manage things, typically implying while someone else is away. So for example, um, if someone is going out to a meeting at the office, you might say, I'll stay here and hold down the fort, meaning I'll deal with anything that comes up here, I'll answer the phones. Um, we use this um, figuratively, I mean literally meaning I'm going to be taking care of everything here. Um, also, we use hold down the fort um, to say, you go ahead and go do that thing and I'm gonna stay put, I'm not gonna go anywhere. Um, stay put being another um, phrasal verb. So you can see how naturally we use many of these phrasal verbs and um, you might notice that often the context will tell you what the meaning is. If you don't know what the meaning is, you can look up the word hold, for example, in the dictionary and then there will be a list of other ways we use hold plus a preposition for a phrasal verb. So it's a good thing to be aware of um, and to check other um, ones that are, you're hearing that are commonly used. You can ask uh, questions about these. I do have a phrasal verbs playlist here on the channel where I talk about some of these. Um, and I also recently covered and wanted to speak briefly on the fact that when we're using these, if I'm just saying, um, for example, I can hold it, then my stress in that phrase, the long stretched word is gonna be the word hold. I can hold it, I can hold the pen. But if I'm saying um, I need to hold back, now the meaning comes in the second word in the preposition and so that's where I stress. So I don't wanna say I, can, I need to hold back but rather I need to hold back. Hold is gonna be a little shorter and back is gonna be stretched. So I don't say I need to hold on, but I need to hold on. And this doesn't follow the typical pattern where words like on and back are usually structure words. They're not as important and the verb hold would be more important and would be stressed. But because hold back and hold on go together, and the meaning really comes from what word am I using withhold, then that's where we get the stress. So that's true for all phrasal verbs, and it is a pattern that um, doesn't follow um, the typical patterns that your brain might know about for word stress. So it's useful to know 
um, when you're pronouncing these that that's probably the key is making sure that you're stressing on the preposition rather than the verb. Okay, feel free to ask uh, any questions about that topic or of course anything that you came to ask me about today uh, in terms of pronunciation, American accent. I'll turn to your questions now. Welcome everyone, it's nice to see you here. Um, and uh, I'll go ahead and take a look at what you have to say. Um, so we have a question about um, the letters I and G at the ends of words um, and whether or not um, what the vowel sound is for ing. So if I said, for example, I'm holding on. Um, in ing, this is in the dictionary the I sound, like in um, did or it and not the E sound like in eat. Um, however, when, the, when a vowel is followed by the NG sound, the ng sound, it sometimes changes how that vowel sounds a little bit. So when I'm saying um, uh, the word, for example, sit versus the word sing, you might hear that the I in ing sounds a little more like the tense e. It's just a little higher because my tongue is lifted for that ng sound, sing and sit. The If I say s, s, I can't really do my i sound the same in sing because my tongue is getting ready for that ng. If I used an e though, um, it would sound like sing, sing, um, versus sing. So I do still want to aim for this I sound um, using something like it sings. Um, you can hear how if I say seeing, seeing, there's a difference between that E sound in the first part of the word and that I sound in the second part of the word. And there I have kind of E ying. A little Y glide comes in for seeing. Um, I do have a video about um, uh, being and being and been um, that might be helpful kind of list to listen for that I sound, that, the, that it's not an E. Um, but yes, this happens on all of the vowels followed by NG. So if I have, for example, rang, it doesn't really sound the same as the a, ah, it's the a ah vowel in both rat and rang. But when I'm saying rat, I can stay open. I don't have that ng following. Rang, rang. It affects the vowel. It gets a little bit nasalized and a little bit higher. I have a few videos talking about that, um, and there, I also discuss that in my Sounds of English course on SpeechModification.com. In that course, I walk you through all of the sounds of English, sounds and spelling, and it can be helpful for understanding um, the way those vowels sound, even though they're consistent, um, it's the same vowel sound. The other sounds in the word affect how a vowel will sound. Um, again, you don't need to change what you're trying to say. The ng sound will just naturally make that change. But if you're trying to listen for that and notice, um, that can be useful. Okay, um, and then that viewer also was asking about the word English. Um, same thing. So even though we spell English with ENG, um, both of these letters have the same I vowel. So we have the stressed I in the first part of ing, and then in the second part, the glish, we have the unstressed I. So it sounds like ing with the I vowel, glish. Um, yeah, that's definitely a useful one to know about. Um, okay. Thank you for that request. Um, nice to see you, everyone. Um, I do have a video for Punxsutawney Phil. <laughs> um, yes, it was just Groundhog's Day. Um, so in Punxsutawney, he was, that's the name of the groundhog in Punxsutawney, um, Pennsylvania. Um, Punxsutawney Phil. So Phil is just the same as um, the verb to fill. In Punxsutawney, um, it's useful to know that that N is an NG sound, just like we were just talking about. So you have Pung, and then this X, Punxsa, it's an S sound. The A says uh, Punxsa, 
the AW says ah, ta, ta, and then uh, we would put the ni, I would put the e sound there. Any y just says e. Punxsutawney, and ta is stressed. Punxsutawney. Um, after class, I can go back and put a link in, or if you're on my channel, you can search for Punxsutawney Phil or for Groundhog, and you'll find my video going into a little more detail on pronouncing his name. Um, yes. Um, we have a question about soup and soap. Um, so soup versus soap. Uh, soup is kind of an unusual spelling in that it has the O vowel for letters O-U. That's not very typical. Um, it would make more sense if we spelled it like soup. Um, and you'll see in the dictionary, the O vowel is represented just by letter U. And then for soap, we have the O vowel. Um, so I'll write that like that. Um, O-A is a typical spelling for soap. It's the, how we spell it in words like road. Um, you could also think about it like soap um, with like in the word rope. It has the true O sound. And in the dictionary, you'll see that O is a diphthong. So the difference between the O of soap is that it's rounded and it glides. O, I close as I go. Soup, U, I'm more rounded and tense and the vowel um, is happening in the back more and higher, U. So using pair, uh, pairs of words, like you could say, it's a new soup and it's old soap, the O and the U, or there's, you could say there's no soap. Um, yeah, that's primarily probably challenging because of how they're spelled, um, but um, not quite as challenging for pronouncing. Um, thank you. Okay, we have a question about the word, um, what syllable to stress in the word antecedent? Um, that is stressed on the second to last syllable, the penultimate syllable, so antecedent is stressed on the C syllable, and it sounds like an, and to letter sh, e says schwa, and then we have the stress, um, we have the letter C saying the, e, the sound, uh, letter E says E, and then the last syllable is very reduced, maybe even has no vowel, just a syllabic N, so it sounds like um, an, to, C didn't antecedent. Um, yeah, great question. And then um, you also were asking about what syllable to stress in um, herpetology. Um, and so for herpetology, um, uh, it would follow a pattern that we have for words with ology, like psychology, um, cosmetology, herpetology, are stressed on the um, not the second to last, the third to last syllable, the ta syllable. So we have, again, kind of her, pa, and then letter O says ah, her, pa, ta. And then this second letter O is going to be another schwa sound, la, g, um, her, pa, ta, la, g. If you're having trouble remembering where the stress goes um, or using that stress pattern, I suggest starting on the stress syllable and building from there. That tends to be really useful in getting the rhythm and the vowel sounds correct. So that would sound like, for example, sedent, antecedent, or tology, herpetology. That can be helpful in also learning patterns where we have um, other words that have similar stress patterns. Um, we don't have hard and fast rules for stress, um, but we do have a lot of similar patterns and you can learn um, often it's the second to last syllable that gets stressed. Um, it does depend on where the word came from into English and um, there's always exceptions to the rules. Um, but um, I do have some videos talking about syllable stress and also showing you how to look that up in the dictionary. And then of course we always talk about the stress of the words in our word of the day videos and in these lessons um, because they do the stress is a big part of how to pronounce words correctly not just the sounds in the words but where which syllables have clear vowels which syllables has have reduced vowels and how lo long we're holding each syllable 
Okay, great. Um, we have a question about how to pronounce heard and hurt. Um, I do think I have a video for this one as well, but I'm happy to cover it again for you. Um, in the word heard, um, we have, uh, both of these have the same vowel sounds. So even though um, there's a very different spelling, this looks like an ear and this looks like an er, they both have the er vowel, which in the dictionary you'll often see like this. I sometimes just write it as er, like in her. Um, so if you think about this herd, I heard it, is the same as this herd, like a herd of animals. Just has that straightforward er vowel, no diphthong, not an ear or an er. Um, and in the dictionary, it's gonna look like this, herd. Uh, and then this one also, we spell that er vowel with ur, ir, er. Um, this is just gonna sound like hurt. Um, so I rewrite that with the letters er. Um, so the difference, and it's gonna just be the same, but with a T. Um, the challenge is, um, with words that end with D and T in English, how we pronounce the D and T depends on what's coming after. So if I'm saying, um, I heard it, it's gonna sound like, I heard it, I heard it. Uh, it links together um, between the, the D and the I. The end of the word heard links into the word it. I heard it, I heard it. So you can even think about like, as though it were one, um, with one uh, word together where we use um, a flap to connect those. So that D sound, I'm not gonna straight make a strong D like I heard it. The D is not gonna release. It's gonna just release into the eye of it, heard it, heard it, just like we would do in um, heading or bedding um, with the D in the middle. And if I say, I heard it, <laughs> I'm not gonna say here in American English, I hurt it. Um, I'm not gonna link the T. I'm not gonna say that T sound. So I'm not gonna say hurt and heard in context. This T is also gonna turn into flap, a flap and it's gonna sound the same, I heard it. Um, um, what happened to your thumb? I heard it um, while I was working. Um, what, did you hear about that? Yes, I heard it. Um, so in this context, they're gonna sound the same. Um, in the context of saying, um, I heard that, or I hurt that, that's where I'm really gonna hear the difference in that heard because it ends with a D, my vowel is gonna be longer. Hurt, because it ends with a T, my vowel is gonna be shorter. So let me get a new color to show you. Um, so when I'm saying, for example, I heard that, you can hear that I'm holding that longer. I'm still not saying a separate D for my TH sound. I'm not saying I heard that. It links together and my D is unreleased. I just release into the TH. I heard that. If I'm saying I hurt that, what happens there is when my T is unreleased, it just shortens up my vowel. I heard that last week. I heard that. I heard that last week. My er is gonna be longer for that D. So this has to do with how we don't release stop sounds at the end, how we link with the following words, and the difference between heard and hurt. Even when I'm saying them by themselves, you can hear, I don't necessarily say heard, hurt. I say just heard, hurt where the vowel is gonna be sh shorter in hurt than it is in heard. Um, so, complicated answer, <laughs> um, but probably you're asking about that because when you're hearing, I heard it, I heard it, and it sounds the same, um, that's because uh, they're pronounced the same. Context will tell me which one I'm saying. If I have to be clear, people will stop and say, I hurt it, I heard it. Um, otherwise, I heard it, um, playing basketball. I heard it while I was playing basketball <laughs> and I was listening. Um, yes, excellent question and definitely um, a bit of a challenge there. Um, that's true for, um, especially for T's and D's at the ends of words in English and also other stop consonants like P's and B's or G's and K's, um, but it comes up the most with the T's and D's um, in terms of the linking because they both 
change to the flap when they link to a vowel sound. Um, okay, thank you for that. Um, I hope that was useful and helped you understand for hurt and hurt and helped you kind of understand that concept uh, for other uh, words and phrases as well. Okay, nice to see so many of you here. Um, let me take the next question. Um, so I'm gonna skip ahead to someone new and then I'll come back to repeated questions from someone who's already been answered. If I have time, we can hopefully get to everyone's questions. Um, okay, we have a question about, do Americans use, uh, drop their T sound after N and is it all around America? So yes, in many cases, in a word like international or internet, um, I just said one with a T and one without, we will often see that T getting dropped and it'll sound more like internet or international, Santa Barbara. It is, does happen all around the US. However, uh, we do use a mix. We also can say and do say internet um, with the T sound. And this one I don't think is so um, like different region to region. I think it does cut across the whole US. It's just that we use a mix. We're not solidly always internet or international. We will also say internet, international. Um, so you may, depending on where you are, notice people using one more than the other. And I would say um, dropping the T is probably more common than using the T, but both things um, do happen and um, it's not so much of a regional difference. Um, yes, that's a great question, thank you. Um, and then you had a follow-up about do we use um, gotten as a past participle form of get in their day-to-day -day conversations? Um, so I've gotten busy um, lately. Um, uh, yeah, I think we use gotten um, for that. Um, he's gotten, um, he's gotten uh, more fit since he's been um, playing sports. Um, okay, and then um, you also had a question about the word often. Um, so the story of often is that um, the correct pronunciation is without a T. Um, the T is silent in often, but it was mispronounced so much <laughs> as often. Uh, people started to use, to put that T in, thinking that they were correcting, um, going back to some additional original pronunciation. So now in the dictionary, it will show it as often or often, and people will use both. Um, so now both are correct. Pronunciation of words changes over time, and this is something where it probably, uh, in some old English form or the way it came into English, um, came from a word that had that T sound, and that's why it was spelled that way. But um, in, in my... Uh, <laughs> um, my lifetime and my history, um, often the correct pronunciation used to be just without a T. Then it changed in the last um, 30, 40 years to add that T sound to be a correct pronunciation. I still prefer it as often um, because in my mind, it's still the only correct way. However, I will acknowledge that dictionaries now show both. So you can use either one. Um, I would just go with whatever's more comfortable for you and um, also to what you tend to hear around you. Um, and people sometimes have strong opinions about <laughs> what's correct when there's more than one correct way. Um, in this case, I am biased towards um, what used to be the only correct way, which is often without a T. Okay, um, great. And we had a question about here and here. And again, these two are the exact same pronunciation, just different spelling and different meaning. Um, so they both have the ear diphthong. Um, and I can say, um, please come here. I can't hear you from over there. So just having that, that ear sound with the H sound for both of those. Um, yeah, those, those can be challenging. These do both follow a pattern where um, ERE does often say ear and EAR often says ear like in clear or dear. Um, yes, um, good question, thank you. Okay, um, we have a question about um, the word photography and videography. Um, so again, these do have the ah um, syllable stressed. So even though I have photo with the stress on O and the O sound. That one sounds like F 
photo in photography the syllable stress changes the vowel sounds and we have um, stress on the ta syllable now my first letter o is going to be the schwa sound um, because it's unstressed fa ta stress falls on the the that second o so we'll have ta as the stress syllable fa ta and then the um, even though we have photograph with the a vowel in um, photography we again again have an unstressed reduced schwa vowel here and then ph says the um, f sound so photography um, again you can practice starting on the stress syllable photography photography that'll get you the correct sounds and the correct rhythm and then for videography, even though we have video, um, first syllable stress, video, when we go to videography, it's the same pattern of videography. Sorry, graphy videography so stressing on the second third to last syllable the ah of photography and videography yeah definitely um, interesting how those change from um, the noun from the one noun to the other so that's really often true where the root word like video or um, photograph um, will change when we add additional syllables um, like photography or videography Great questions today. Thank you so much for being here, for watching and listening. Um, I do have this class each Saturday at this time is our live class. And then daily I have my word of the day videos, which come from requests from comments um, and from classes. So you can watch those each day and learn about specific words and patterns, as well as asking your questions um, uh, in, in the comments for um, adding for me to add other words to that list. Okay, um, I'll take a couple more questions and then we'll need to wrap up for today. I will be back again next week. If you're watching this not live, you can leave a comment or question um, after the video and I'll get back to you with resources as well as um, I can add your word to my list to cover in a future class. Okay, we have a question about um, voice placement and resonance in American English and how to make it. So um, one of the things I talk about with American voice placement and resonance is really that we have um, our home base is vowel schwa, the uh sound, which is a central uh, relaxed sound. If you can build um, a solid relaxed schwa sound, that's going to make a big difference in, um, in your speech overall. Um, so uh, thinking about um, depending, finding kind of where that home base is in your native language. One place that we can hear that is in the filler sounds that people use. So when, when you hear Americans talking and they're thinking, they're gonna say things like, uh, or, um, and you can hear this sound of this vowel is gonna be the, uh, the schwa sound. It's the same sound we have in longer words like in um, banana. Um, we have banana sounds like ba na na. Those unstressed syllables in longer words are the schwa, the uh, and that's where our tongue rests when we're not speaking. So our jaw is slightly open, our tongue is in the middle. It's not high or low or front or back, and it's very lax. Uh, banana. Um, and we use this sound in all of our connected speech. So the placement really is central for American English. Um, and you can just hear me saying, um, as I'm thinking. So figuring out what the placement is in your native language and then shifting to, uh, kind of as your home base, working from words with, uh, working from, um, syllables, having a lot of, uh, sounds, and then in connected speech as well. For example, if I'm saying something like, um, uh, I need to go to the place, 
I'm not going to be saying I need to go to the place or the place. I'm going to be using a lot of schwas here. I need to go. I need instead of to with oo, it's going to become a. Uh. I need to go to. This is going to get flapped. I need to go to the place. Uh 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 uh. So if I have that kind of central placement, that changes how I'm connecting words. It changes my pronunciation of words, and it gives me that more American resonance and American tone. Um, I talk about this um, in connected speech in videos in my Real Talk course and my Real Talk playlist, where um, we have these reductions and the linking um, and that those sorts of placement cues. And of course, also just working on um, words with schwa, the other lax vowels, and that kind of connected speech can help you with that um, general tone for American English. Okay, um, thank you for the great questions today. I'm sorry if I didn't get to everyone's question. I will be back again next week with our live video and do feel free to leave comments and questions. Um, I can re refer you to resources on the channel and also resources on our website, speechmodification.com. That's where we have a lot of free practice materials as well as our online courses. I always recommend our Sounds of English course to walk you through the basics, the fundamentals, every sound in English and how they're pronounced and how they're spelled accent patterns to watch out for. It's a great way to build a strong foundation to confidently pronounce any word you like in American English. And then some of our more advanced courses like our American Accent six week course or our Real Talk course are gonna get more into the details of accent, fluent speech in English, um, and not beyond just the basic pronunciation as well. Thanks for being here and being a part of class today. And I look forward to seeing you tomorrow in our next word of the day class, as well as in our next week's live question and answer class. Thanks for watching this video, for liking, commenting, and sharing. And those of you who have subscribed to the channel or joined as channel members, I truly appreciate your support and I look forward to seeing you in future videos. I'm Christine Dunbar from speechmodification.com. Remember, if you want to sound like a native speaker, you can do it. Speechmodification.com. Bye everyone. Hope to see you again soon.